People love freedom. Well, people love the word freedom. Freedom! <gasps> slavery has been a feature of societies across time and place. Freedom is what makes America unique, not slavery. Freedom is what makes America unique. We are a country based on freedom, not on slavery. And the reason is, without freedom, you will never know joy. You will never have the full life that God meant you to have. And it's not just in America, we get it here too. So what is this all about? You know what? Sorry. What is this all about? This is about our freedoms. Can you be any more generic? But Americans love the word freedom. Like, they are in love with the word freedom. St. Augustine says, how do you understand a nation? You look what it loves supremely. And there's no question, what America loves supremely is freedom. Oh, I thought he was putting your flag on everything. How dare you! That's the flag my grandpappy rebelled against! And telling people to speak English. We need some more ketchup. Okay. English, though, Javier, this is America. But not just any freedom. The ordered freedom that comes through Exodus and Deuteronomy from the Bible. Mm. And that's what's been lost. But don't be fooled into thinking that freedom involves being able to eat or have your basic needs met. Most Americans persist in believing that a government powerful enough to give you everything you want will also necessarily be powerful enough to take away everything you have, including your freedom. And don't go thinking that it means you get rights, <laughs> no matter who you are. The transgender community in the United States is reeling as Republican lawmakers and prominent conservative figures try to curtail their rights. A record number of bills relating to health care, access to bathrooms, even drag performances have already been tabled this year in state legislatures. One realtor and local organizations tell me they've seen an increase in people looking to move to the land of Lincoln, all to escape anti-LGBTQ plus legislation in other states. Freedom! For me, probably not you guys. Freedom is more like an idea. But more than anyone in the world, evangelical Christians love freedom. But do they really? everybody thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all the other wonderful stuff you do because uh why why was it again oh yeah you're wonderful people i put the links down below for the social media as well as the patreon and the merchandise so you can click around down there and uh have some fun thank you free will is one of those topics that scares me and kind of breaks my brain so i didn't want to go into this topic without first reading about it also i've been very busy lately so i am very grateful for our sponsor blinkist because thanks to them, I was able to quickly get the powerful insights from this book, The Human Instinct by Kenneth R. Miller. He talks about how we evolved to have reason, consciousness, and free will. See, with Blinkist, 15 minutes are all that it takes to get powerful insights into different topics and empower your knowledge. If you're commuting, it gives you a quick insight on your way to work. If you're jogging or you can't read right now, you can listen to the book in 15 minutes. I believe it's jogging or yogging. It might be a soft J. I'm not sure, but... So Blinkist is this app that helps you understand the most important things from over 5,500 nonfiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. With the help of Blinkist, you can discover new perspectives, broaden your horizons, have exciting conversations, you won't be the boring person at the party, and you will experience aha moments all the time. And they have this cool new feature called Spaces. This allows you to create spaces with your friends or family where you can add, share, and recommend titles from Blinkist Library all in one place in the app. You can make a space for a group of people, a topic like productivity or mindfulness, or like I did, free will. And then all members of a shared space can access all the titles in the space with or without a Blinkist premium subscription. That's pretty fantastic. As a premium user, you can create multiple spaces with the same people or with new ones. And because I love you so much, you get 25% off the annual premium. Start your seven day trial today by clicking right here or the link in the description. You don't replace all your reading with this, but it's a great way to add more books in your brain, especially with your busy lifestyle.
Evangelicals love the word freedom. Just look at this big rally called the Freedom Experience with our boy Justin Bieber. Who is Justice Bieber? He... It's a crime fighting Bieber. We are officially in love! That's what we are, we're in love with Jesus! So give me Jesus and keep your religion. Give me Jesus and keep your morality. Give me Jesus and keep your elitism. Give me Jesus and keep your prejudice. What I need is the real God to stand up and set me free. Oh, wow. This guy really seems like he cares about freedom. He seems really cool. He must really believe in people making their own decisions. Oh, he was sued for forcing his staff to give 10% of their income. Uh, he also said that being gay is as bad as murder or sexual assault. But overall, freedom is good. You see, a person's never really and truly free until they're free on the inside. And many people would tell you they're free, and at the same time, they're enslaved by all kinds of bondage. Sometimes they're almost like they're in a prison, and yet on the outside, they can go sort of where they want to go, do sort of what they want to do, but somehow on the inside, they're, in, they're enslaved, enslaved by all kinds of things. And the truth is, you'll never really be free until you are set free by the person of Jesus Christ. That's right, you are free from sin. I mean, you still won't be able to stop sinning. That's still going to keep happening. But you are free from the bondage of sin. Whatever that means, because again, you're still going to keep doing it. And sometimes as Christians, I think we take for granted the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Yeah. No, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing Born Puppet today. But according to them, true freedom only exists within Christianity. And usually, but not always, their brand of Christianity. This is a truth that you got to understand. Freedom is only found in truth. See, a lot of people are trying to claim freedom in their life, but they are not honest enough to walk in the truth. You can see so plainly that they're not actually offering freedom. They want obedience, and freedom is just the marketing tool. Just think about how free Jesus is eternal. Well, you're not going to get any more free than that. So what did he do? Based on love for us, he put restrictions on himself by becoming human. So somewhere in that foundation, you're going to find what true freedom is. It's not free from all restrictions. It's finding the liberating restrictions that you were designed to to uh, adhere to. As a writer, I get that restrictions can be helpful. If I'm told to write a play that takes place in one room with three actors and lasts one hour, and I have a week to write it, I get excited about that challenge, and I am more likely to start writing than if I am told, write whatever you want and take all the time you need. But saying restrictions can be useful, and saying that restrictions are a form of freedom is not the same thing. So first admit that it's a really restrictive religion, and then try to sell us on why that is a good thing. Don't bait and switch us. Here's the reason the Christian life is freedom. The transformation is a transformation from bondage into freedom. Here's the reason. Freedom is doing what you love to do. Yes, agreed. But I would argue that your freedom should end at the moment your actions hurt another person. If. Oh, he's, he's not done. What you love to do is what you ought to do. And transformation is the change of our hearts so that what we love to do is what we ought to do. So true freedom is doing what you were told and liking it. The freest of all people in the universe are the people who do exactly what they like to do and not suffer for it in hell. Yeah, because nothing says freedom like eternal punishment if you don't follow the rules. And of course, if we're talking about freedom, we are also talking about free will. Well, what does that say about free will? I 
COVID. Which is the number one reason, or the number one excuse, depending on how you look at it, that Christians give to explain why undesirable things happen, or why evil things happen. Number one is that God did not create robots. We need to understand and accept the fact that whenever God created angels and also ultimately mankind, he created all of us with free will. He created us with the ability to choose, to choose to obey, to choose not to obey, to choose between good and evil. And if God would have controlled Satan in such a way that it was not possible for Satan to choose evil instead of good, then God would also have been removing free will, which would have been against his original intent for creation. So God created the spooky, scary dude and let him have free reign on earth because he really values free will. God is omniscient and he knows the future. So he definitely knew that Adam and Eve would sin, but he created them anyway and gave them a free will with which they chose to sin. He put Adam and Eve near a tree that if they ate from it, He'd curse all their descendants for eternity because he loves free will that much? Number one, it may not be feasible for God to create a world in which everyone freely embraces salvation and comes to him. It's, it's logically impossible to make people do something freely. So it may sadly be the case that in any world of free creatures, there will always be some who will freely reject God and his every effort to save them. Okay, but then is it logically impossible for him to show evidence that he exists? Is it logically impossible to get his followers to stop being such terrible examples of humanity? Is it logically impossible not to punish people for eternity for rejecting a claim that doesn't seem to match up to reality? People will say, well, why didn't God create a universe where everyone believes? While that's logically possible, it might not be actually achievable with free creatures. Because by definition, if you're free, you can sin. So it might be that God creates, any universe God creates, people are ultimately gonna sin, okay? So he can't force people to love him because love by definition must be freely given, it can't be forced. This universe could be the universe where the maximum number of people are saved and the minimum number of people are lost. So God did like a Doctor Strange thing and picked the best possible scenario of a universe and landed on this one? The one with the melting glaciers and icebergs? The one with the wars and genocide? The one where until recently you had to have a bunch of children because you knew that the odds were that a lot of them would die young? The one where our light source gives us cancer? The one with the masked singer? This. This is the one that God went with. It really is up to us, isn't it? But here's the thing about all of this. Most of them also believe that God has a plan. But I know, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know. Yeah. Somebody say, I know. I know. Now, this is God speaking, so the inference is you don't know, but I know the plans I have for you. And we know that in all things, this is Romans 8, 28, God works together, the good and the bad for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I'm not nervous. I got purpose. I'm not nervous. He's got a plan. Jeremiah 29 11, I know you well, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. When I was a teenager, my parents decided to move us across the country from a small town in southern Ontario to a small town in southern Alberta. My dad had arthritis in his whole body and believed that the drier climate would be better for his health. The original plan was to move to British Columbia, but when we drove out a year earlier to figure out where in BC we wanted to live, we stopped at a gas station in Alberta on the way, where we happened to meet a real estate agent who approached my dad to see if he needed prayer. And then we went to the local church and got prayed over by the pastor. And that was the sign from God that we needed of where we were going to live. My dad fixed up an old trailer and my siblings and I painted a happy face on the back and Jeremiah 29 11 on the side. We were following God's plan across the country. A plan that I guess included that trailer breaking many times on the way to Alberta. To, to new beginnings. We immediately started going to that church that prayed over my dad because we thought that that's what God was calling us, to be a part of this church community. And we went there for about a year before we realized that it was a creepy cult. While we were there, my dad's arthritis got way, way worse. 
My mom had a terrible fall and broke her arm and collarbone. So as soon as I went to college in Alberta, my family moved back to Ontario. In total, they lived there a year and a half. Eventually, way too long later, I realized that, that in that verse, God must have just been talking to Jeremiah and telling Jeremiah that he had plans for him and that in no way did he intend this for everybody. Because if it were meant for everybody, then everybody would have an awesome life and everybody would prosper. We uprooted our lives for this plan. And over 20 years later, I can't figure out what that plan could have been. The Bible says once you trust Jesus as your Savior, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So when you think about your relationship to God, and we talk about the will of God, we're talking about his purpose, his plan, his desire for your life. That is, God didn't ignore you when you were born. His purpose, his plan, his desire for your life. And I wonder, when is the last time you ever stopped to think, now, Lord, where am I in your plan? Where am I in your purpose? Where am I in your will for my life? And what I want us to think about in this message is, can we be sure? Can we be sure of God's will and purpose and plan for our life? I did this all through my 20s. I constantly worried that I wasn't following God's plan. You see, when I was 14, I believed that God had called me at camp to be a youth pastor. Why me? Why not you? And that was what I was going to do because I was going to follow God's plan. It didn't matter that I had social anxiety and hated being in large groups. God would help me overcome that. It didn't matter that I wasn't married and most churches wanted to hire married people because, you know, two for one. And also, they thought that single people were more likely to be inappropriate with the kids, even though statistically, married people can be very creepy. It didn't matter that I couldn't play an instrument and most churches wanted to hire people who could play an instrument and lead worship because, again, two for one. It didn't matter that when I actually started working as a youth pastor, I realized I did not like doing the job. I believed I was meant to be a youth pastor, so I was a youth pastor. Until I was able to convince myself that that was just a temporary plan and God was now calling me on a new path. Because I couldn't make my own decisions. I had to make myself believe that everything I did was because it was part of God's plan. In my opinion, that is not living in freedom. Almost every person, especially young and older. Especially Lisa. But especially Bert. Everybody wants to know, what is God's plan for my life? I want to tell you that God has a plan but you will never discover it until you first meet him it's not found in the university it's found in his presence it's found in him when you encounter him he wants to reveal his plan now here's the question do you trust the person even when you don't like the plan because i did not say yes to my understanding of god's plan i said yes to god And the second yes, the second yes is not just to the blessing. The second yes is to believing that God is working even when his presence is hard to discern. You can either keep living your life with all these problems you have, or you could buy a religious mystery box that has all the answers in it. But you can't see what's in it until you buy it. Nothing! Absolutely nothing! Stupid! You're so stupid! But if you have free will and we have freedom, how does it make sense at all that there would be a plan in the first place? And remember that it's not just that he has a plan for us. He has the whole world in his hands. He has a plan for everybody. God planned to use that nation to impact the world and to spread the truth of the fact that there is only one God and his name is Jehovah. God planned the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death at the cross. God planned our redemption before he ever created the world. He says that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. God planned the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Virgin Mary. God planned to evangelize the world of that New Testament day through the Apostle Paul. 
She asks, why didn't God kill Satan? After all, if Satan is such a baddie, why is he allowed to continue his reign of terror? Well, first, here are some things we do know. We know that God has a plan and a purpose even for Satan. And we also know that Satan will finally be judged. You can read about that in Revelation 20. Satan will pay for his crimes, but until then, God is accomplishing his divine purpose. For example, the apostle Peter says, Jesus was crucified and killed at the hands of lawless men, yet it was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2.23. So don't miss this. God brought about the salvation of the world through the actions of wicked men. So why didn't God kill Satan? Because he's got a plan that he's accomplishing. So it's not just because we have free will and Satan has free will that this happens. It's also because God has a divine plan. So if God is planning all this stuff, what is our role in it? They make it sound like it's pretty awesome to have a divine purpose. And, and I get that. I get that for sure. We spend our whole lives trying to figure out how we fit into all of this. We get the job we're supposed to get. We marry the person we're supposed to marry. We get that house with the unfinished basement. And eventually we have a midlife crisis when we worry that this is all there is. Or we don't do that stuff. And we wish we had done all that stuff. And we have a crisis about that. So it can be pretty enticing to believe that we have a divine purpose and a divine plan. Plan? plan when in reality maybe figuring it out is part of what makes life great it is part of the adventure us finding our way is the adventure but yeah believing that god has a plan for our lives sounds pretty good on the surface it makes us feel pretty special until you realize that it just means that you were a pawn in a bigger plan so many Christians, if you use the word coincidence around them, they'll immediately tell you there's no such thing as coincidence. What are the odds? See, what you think is a coincidence is God's placement for you. He placed you in that family. They crazy, but there's some things that God had to teach you. Sure, Michael, that kind of works if like your family's annoying or something, but what if they're really abusive? What if you spend the rest of your life in therapy because of an abusive parent? How is that part of God's plan? How is that the divine order? There's some things that he had to develop on the inside of you. There's some things you had to build up a tolerance against for the purpose that he has called you to. And we fight the place so hard. Oh, come on, y'all. We fight the job that God placed us in. Oh, I'm coming into your house. We fight the people God placed us around. We fight the church he planted us in. Well, they don't do it like that. They don't play my songs. They don't do what I know. I like the more like, woo. And they want to woo, woo, woo. And I just, I don't know. And God said, maybe you're an answer for something that's supposed to happen that I see up ahead, but you're fighting the place that I put you in. There's no coincidence with God. If you're in the midst of a place that feels broken and dirty, and you're like, my workplace is screwed up, family's screwed up, my friends are screwed up, you don't happen to be in the midst of it. God puts you in the midst of it for a purpose. God knew that it needed a solution, and a solution looked like you. You're carrying Jesus into it. I had this friend in college that was very nice, uh, but also kind of loud and kind of a lot sometimes, which I get I can be that too. He also had the same first name as me and the same initials as me, and this became his whole thing around me. He was basically this guy. Is that Zach? Or am I Zach? Whoa! Oh, oh, wow. Never gets old, huh? So one day, it was his birthday, and he was going around telling everybody it was his birthday as an adult in college. He even went up to me and said happy birthday to me and then said that he was confused because we have the same name. Because I thought we had the same birthday. Happy birthday, Michael. Thanks. So as a joke, uh, when he left, I loudly started telling people that my birthday was March 10th. And after that, a guy came up to me and asked me why I was saying March 10th. And I said that it was my birthday. And then he said that it was his birthday too. And we started talking and then realized we were both from Ontario. 
and we were both Dutch, and eventually realized that he was related to people I went to elementary school with. And then we realized that we both worked in the same store, but in different malls, like the same chain of stores. We ended up becoming friends, and I became friends with him and his wife. And when I moved to Toronto, they were the first people I looked up. And since then, me and his wife have done many plays together and worked on comedy things together. And he started a podcast with one of my close friends. All because one time I loudly shouted my birthday because somebody who has my same name was being annoying. There can be only one. What? Highlander man, the Kurgan? Remember, I'd yell it at you whenever we passed each other in the hallway? Like it was yesterday, man. Awesome. 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 Now, some would look at that and say, how on earth can you not think that this is divine? The other day, I was watching Ted Lasso, and this scene happened. Yeah, I know everybody's birthday. Really? Liam Neeson. June 7th. Keenan Turner. November 26th. Chuck Norris, Sharon Stone, and Osama Bin Laden. All March the 10th. Woo, you are good. And I immediately perked up. Like, of all the birthdays, why did they pick my birthday? Oh, sorry. Sorry, buddy. That's actually kind of sad. You see, there's this thing called the birthday problem, where if there are 23 people in a room, there is more than a 50% chance that someone has the same birthday as you, which sounds wrong. And that percentage grows as more people enter the room. It's your birthday next week. My birthday next week, the 10th. Me too. Me too. Yeah. And I don't know the chances of the rest of this stuff happening. But here's the thing. If we didn't realize that we had a lot in common, and we didn't really like each other's company... It would just be a story about meeting somebody who had the same birthday. We wouldn't have become friends. We would have just moved on. We assign meeting to things after the fact. There are many, many chance meetings that don't amount to anything. And there are many more people that we might have even more in common with that we simply never meet. But if I found out that that wasn't a chance meeting but that it was coordinated by a divine person, I think that actually makes it lose significance because it's not an interesting story about random things happening. It's a scripted event. If God planned it, it meant that he made me show up in the same place as somebody who had the same name as me. He put the words in both of our mouths. He also would have had to direct my friend to be there to hear those words and come over and talk to me. That's not an interesting story. That's a puppet show. I am glad that I am not some NPC in God's big video game. And it also destroys the argument that the reason bad things happen is because God values free will. Because even if they don't really believe that God is controlling our every move, there seems to be the assumption that God at least takes control sometimes to get us to do what he wants us to do. I'm reminded of the Old Testament where God was trying to get the attention of a backslidden nation of Israel. And he says in the book of Amos, I have killed your youth by the sword. And even still then you did not return to me. In other words, I've used this tragedy as an attempt to try to get you to come back to me. And even still you did not return. In the same way, the Sunday after 9-11, the churches were packed with people that were seeking to find answers to a tragic experience. Could it be that God used that tragedy to get our attention as a nation and turn us back towards him? Imagine thinking that God convinced a bunch of terrorists to kill thousands of people because not enough people were going to church. And then thinking that this was a good thing and that this God deserves to be worshipped. But there is a debate in Christianity about how much God does predestine things and how much is left up to free will or to chance. Bible so puts it that our hearts are so far astray in our sin that we are incapable of choosing God. 
if that sounds strange to some hearers, many of uh, many of my hearers are going to be aware of the the Calvinist Armenian debate on this issue, and they may be surprised to hear that both Jacob Arminius and John Calvin both believed that the human will was utterly incapable of choosing for Christ. We were so lost in sin that unless God provides grace to us prior to our decision, we cannot be saved. Now, the difference between those two men is that Arminius believed that God provides that grace to everyone, and Calvin said, no, only to those who genuinely are saved. I'm not going to get into all of that, but let me say this. Predestination, as I understand it, is God's determination to elect his own. According to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that God chose us before the foundation of the world. And so that should provide us this assurance that when I am saved, I am saved because God has had mercy on me, not because I've been so wise that I've chosen for God. If free will means that God gives humans the opportunity to make choices that genuinely affect their destiny, then yes, human beings do have a free will. The world's current sinful state is directly linked to choices made by Adam and Eve. God created mankind in his own image, and that includes the ability to choose. How so there is free will when we need a scapegoat. However, free will does not mean that mankind can do anything he pleases. Our choices are limited to what is in keeping with our nature. For example, a man may choose to walk across a bridge or not to walk across it. What he may not choose is to fly over the bridge. His nature prevents him from flying. In a similar way, a man cannot choose to make himself righteous. His sin nature prevents him from canceling his guilt. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So God tells us to be righteous but knows we can't do it? So, free will is limited by nature. This limitation does not mitigate our accountability. The Bible is clear that we not only have the ability to choose, we also have the responsibility to choose wisely. Okay, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The Bible isn't clear about anything. And that's why there is so much confusion about everything in that book. Just because God knows what we're going to do doesn't mean he's causing us to do it. I know the sun's going to rise in the east tomorrow, but does that mean I'm causing it to rise in the east? No. No, but God is supposed to be the one causing it. He is all-powerful, right? Knowledge does not necessarily imply causation. That's number one. Secondly, it's unavoidable for God if he knows all things, that whenever he creates the, any universe he creates, he knows the outcome. Thirdly, the word predestined, you say used in Ephesians 1, doesn't mean that we don't have free will. It means that God has guaranteed the outcome. God is guaranteeing the outcome. If you're in Christ, you're predestined to be glorified. You're predestined to be with Jesus forever. No, though. You either guarantee the outcome or there is free will. You can't have both. Not fully. Um, his knowledge is sort of like an infallible barometer of the weather. The, the barometer never fails. It's always right. But clearly, the barometer doesn't determine the weather. If the weather were different, the barometer would have been different. So it, it, the, the foreknowledge of God is like an infallible barometer, and you're free to do whatever you want, but you're just not free to fool the barometer. God knows whatever it is you do. So your action is logically prior to what God foreknows, but his foreknowledge is chronologically prior to what you do. There's a huge difference between knowing how a past event turned out and knowing how a future event will turn out. You can argue that God is outside of time, but then you can't argue that he is active in the world and doing things to affect the world. Not if you believe in free will, or if you believe him to be loving or to be love. Because it means that every person who is assaulted, every child who dies, every awful thing that happens is because at the very least, God could have stopped it, but didn't, or that he caused it. 
But there are some that say it is all predestined and we don't really have free will at all. Has God predetermined every tiny detail in the universe, such as dust particles in the air? And then I should add here, including all our besetting sins. Yes. Uh, there's a great quote from Spurgeon about dust motes. I don't even know what a dust moat is, but when I get up in the morning in my room, there's a, a window to the side of the bed here, and a beam of light will be shining through at certain times of year when I get up. It's shining through, and as, as I look into the dark, I see nothing. As I look through the beam, I see the dust in the room. <laughs> I'm flying around saying, I'm breathing that stuff. Yes, you are. Um, so Spurgeon says, every one of those is keeping its position and moving through the air by God's appointment. Then what is even the point? We might as well be that dust in the wind. You're my boy, Blue! You're my boy, Blue. And if you read the Bible, it does make sense that someone would conclude that we don't really have free will. It says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, so it must mean we lose our free will at some point. It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he wouldn't listen to Moses and Aaron. He valued people's free will so little that he killed everyone but eight in a flood for not choosing the right option. And then he confused everyone with different languages because they built a tower and he worried that they would become too powerful. So yeah, free will doesn't seem to be the God of the Bible's number one priority. It is impossible for us to fully understand the relationship between God's sovereignty and man's free will and responsibility. Only God truly knows how they work together in his plan of salvation. With this doctrine, probably more so than with any other, it is crucially important to admit our inability to fully grasp the nature of God and our relationship with him. That's Christian for, it doesn't make any sense, but we have to believe in contradictory things because we have a contradictory book. And that's what it is all about. The whole religion is a balancing act or juggling act between conflicting ideas. In this case, ideas that can't possibly coexist. Pow! We took care of the time travel paradox. All right! right. It's freedom, but with restrictions. It's freedom with punishments for disobedience. It's free will, but it's also a plan. It's free will, but also God can control what you do. Bad things happen because of our choices, but good things happen because of God. I'm doing the math here, and it's just not adding up. But here's the good news. The good news is that this is all made up, and we don't have to believe any of it. I don't know how free will works. I don't know how my brain works, but I know at least we feel like we have free will, and I know at least that we can try to make this world a better place. And I know that there's no plan for my life. And that should be freeing to hear. Freedom means we aren't puppets. Freedom means we aren't controlled by some greater destiny. But we get to figure that out for ourselves. Freedom cost a buck oh five. Hey everybody, thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may benefit from watching it, send it their way. Thank you so much, and thanks again to our sponsor, Blinkist. Uh, check them out in the description box. You are all wonderful. Work, 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 Skyman. <laughs>